Well, hello, dear friends. My name is Jerry Hayes. I am the Abbot General of the Apostolic Disciples of the Way. And uh, the Apostolic Disciples of the Way is the discipling arm of the Apostolic Orthodox Church International. And the Apostolic Orthodox Church International is a branch of the Oneness Pentecostal movement of the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. And matter of fact, this video uh, is being made in 2020. We are doing a series of videos on the Godhead. And this is a, uh, a branch of or a genre of New Testament theology that has been uh, one of the main emphases of our ministry and especially of the Apostolic Orthodox Church International. We are, as I said, associated with the Oneness Pentecostals, and, uh, but we prefer to use the term modalistic monarchianism. And uh, we would, uh, we're doing a, a series of studies from a book that I wrote in 2015 entitled Godhead Theology. And uh, today, I'm going to be reading, really, the very first chapter. And this is a, out of sequence, because when we started these readings, I jumped in a little bit late in the book because of uh, some particular inquiries that I had at that time concerning that particular subject matter. But now we're going, I'm going back to the first chapter, and I'm going to be reading that chapter in this uh, video that you are now watching. Before we do, however, uh, I would like to go to the Lord in prayer, and I'd like for you to just uh, believe with me that God would prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the information that I am about to share with you today. Lord Jesus, we come to you, and we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness today. We ask that you would make our hearts receptive to receive truth. Lord, we ask this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. At the beginning of the 20th century, a dear sister by the name of Mrs. S.K. Grimes in 1924 wrote a great anthem, is a great song of the church, that uh, I would like to just read to you at this point to begin our reading today. This song is called The Great I Am. It's one of my favorite songs of all time in our hymnals throughout our churches. And uh, the song goes like this, the first verse. God is Elohim of all the holy prophets, the El Shaddai of all the seers and sages. He's the mighty one, of all the sacred pages. He's the great, he's the great I am. And then the chorus is, he's the great I am, the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace, the great eternal wonder. Holy counselor, Zion's righteous governor. He's the great, he's the great I am. The second verse says, He's Jehovah God, the coming King of glory. He's the true Nisi, the Lord of grace and favor. He is Jesus Christ, Redeemer, Friend, and Savior. He's the great, He's the great I Am. The third verse is, He's the strong Rophi, the healing one of heaven. He's the Holy Ghost, the Spirit poured from glory. He's the sacred one of all the gospel story. He's the great, he's the great I am. And then lastly, the chorus again. He's the great I am, the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace, the great eternal wonder. Holy counselor, Zion's righteous governor. He's the great, he's the great I am. Oh, praise the Lord. What a wonderful song that is. And how much it is blessed throughout the years as we have sing it uh, in our churches for 
over, uh, well, for almost a hundred years now. That song was written in 1924. As we go into uh, the 21st century, the uh, Oneness Pentecostal Church is on the threshold of a great change. And uh, I am pleased that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, has permitted me to be a part of the, uh, of the group of men and the group of people that are pushing and promoting for us as a movement to push into this uh, change that the Holy Ghost is bringing upon the church. And uh, I would encourage you to follow me in my blog post uh, the uh, Bishop's Epistle, and uh, also in my uh, YouTube videos, and you will understand what I'm talking about, about the change that is coming to the church. It is a morphing, actually. Actually, it is, uh, it is uh, a milestone of growth in the Oneness Pentecostal movement, a time when I think we're going to see more structure, we're going to see more of a liturgical bent taking hold of Pentecostalism, and it's just really an exciting time. Uh, the Godhead uh, theology that we have held so dear for the last hundred years is, is becoming more refined and more defined, and uh, things that, uh, we, that have been barriers between the Oneness Pentecostals and Trinitarianism, those barriers are being torn down. And the decades ahead of us are going to be decades of great change and uh, uh, great maturing in the movement. And uh, I am uh, approaching the autumn of my life now, and I might not see the change in its, in its completeness, the convergence uh, happen in its completeness, but uh, my children will, and my grandchildren definitely will, and hopefully they will be able to look back on these readings and on uh, this book that these readings are from, and they will say, yes, I, I, my grandfather, my father told me that this convergence was coming and here it is now, we're right in the midst of it. Well, praise God. By the way, I want to encourage you, if you don't have a copy of Godhead Theology, Modalism, the Original Orthodoxy, I want you to encourage I want to encourage you to get your own personal copy. You can purchase this from Amazon.com forward slash books. Just enter the name of the book, Godhead Theology, or my name, Bishop Jerry Hayes. And my bookshelf will come up, and there are over 20 uh, titles there for you to pick from, all dealing with uh, uh, New Testament church dogma, New Testament church theology. I think you will, you, you will thrill at this book, whether you are a oneness believer, a modalistic monarchian, or if you are a Trinitarian, this book will be a great addition to your library. I want to read the introduction to Godhead Theology today. And in the introduction, we're just simply talking about the different worldviews of the Godhead. So I'm just going to jump into it right here. The term Godhead, and I, I hear this term misdefined all the time, and I, I understand why we misdefine it really has nothing to do with the word head, <laughs> but uh, the term Godhead is from the Middle English Godhead or Godhood, and it's totally unrelated, as I have said, to the word head. The word denotes the divinity or substance, the Greek word is ousia, of God in Christianity. John Wycliffe introduced the term Godhead into the English Bible versions in two places. And though somewhat archaic, the term survives in modern English because of its use in the Tyndale New Testament 
and the Geneva Bible and the authorized King James Version of 1611. In the King James Version, the word is used to translate three different Greek words. Theon, an adjective meaning divine or godly. It's found in Acts chapter 17 and verse 29. Theot, Theos, a noun which means divinity or divine nature. It's found in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. And lastly, Theotes, a noun meaning deity. It's found in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. Now, uh, this book, Godhead Theology, is a study in the Godhead or in the Godhood, especially in Christology, the Godhood of Jesus Christ. Now, it will take us along the road that will traverse Holy Scripture and histo historical epochs. Hopefully, along the way, we may become more enlightened concerning the God that all of us worship. Many of our day, sadly, are confused as to the object of our worship. One is reminded of the words of Christ to the woman at the well of Sechar. Quote, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews, Jesus said. Now, in this text, Jesus validates the Godhead theology of the Jews. This fact will be important to us later on in our study when we compare Hebraic Christology with Lagos Christology. In the very beginning of this work, Godhead Theology, uh, we should introduce certain terms that have historically been used to express the different ways in which people have conceived of God. Now, man is a religious creature and has always felt the need to worship, finding in that need the basic purpose for his creation. God has placed in mankind an innate desire to search and to reach out to his creator. That man has done, though he's not always understood just who or what that creator is or was. Now, in this introduction that I'm reading here to Godhead Theology, we'll introduce particular terminologies that will help us catalog the different worldviews concerning God. By and large, it can be agreed that there are three fundamental ideas relating to deity, polytheism, pantheism, and monotheism. So let's look at those three right here. Polytheism. Polytheism refers to the worship of or belief in multiple deities, usually assembled in a pantheon of gods and goddesses, along with their own religions and rituals. Adherents of polytheism are called polytheists. In most religions which accept polytheism, the different gods are representations of forces of nature or ancestral principles. It is, it is a type of theism. Within theism, polytheism contrasts with monotheism, the belief in a singular God. Polytheists do not always worship all the gods equally, but can be henotheistic, specializing in the worship of one particular deity. Other polytheists can be cathiontheistic, worshiping different deities at different times. Polytheism is well documented in historical religions of classical antiquity, especially ancient Greek religion and ancient Roman religions. After the decline of the Greco-Roman polytheism, they're represented in tribal religions, such as the Germanic uh, pagan or Slavic paganism and their religions. Now, does the Bible teach polytheism? Of course not. 
The gatekeeper to the exclusive worship of Yahweh is the Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou settest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house, and on thy gates, end quote. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Polytheistic religions practiced today include Hinduism, Chinese traditional religion, Japanese uh, uh, Shinto, and neo-pagan, uh, those religions of the neo-pagan context. Now, the second uh, type of uh, Godhead understanding, the second worldview, is pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that God is the transcendent reality of which the material universe and human beings are only manifestations. It involves the denial of God's personality and expresses a tendency to identify God with, in, and as nature. It is any religious belief or philosophical doctrine that identifies God with the universe. Adherents of pantheism are called pantheist. Pantheism asserts that the universe, or nature as the totality of everything, is identical with divinity, or that everything composes an all-encompassing, immanent God. Pantheists, thus, do not believe in a distinct personal or anthropomorphic God. Pantheism is found today in some schools of Hinduism, but most assuredly in Taoism. Pantheism is the view that God is everything and everyone, and that everyone and everything is God. <laughs> Pantheism is similar to polytheism, the belief in many gods, but goes beyond polytheism to teach that everything is, in fact, God. A tree is God, a rock is God, an animal is God, the sky is God, the sun is God, you are God, etc. Pantheism is the supposition behind many cults and false religions. An example is Hinduism and Buddhism to an extent, and various the various unity and unification cults and mother nature worshipers. These would be pantheists. Does the Bible teach pantheism? No, the Bible does not teach pantheism. What many people confuse as pantheism in the Bible is the doctrine of God's omnipresence. Psalms 139 verses 7 through 8 declares, quote, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. End quote. New International Version. God's omnipresence means he is present everywhere. There is no place in the universe where God is not. Now, this is not the same thing as pantheism. God is everywhere, but he is not everything. Yes, God is present inside a tree and inside a person, but that does not make the tree or person God. Pantheism is not at all a biblical belief system. The clearest biblical argument against pantheism are the countless commands against idolatry. 
The Bible forbids the worship of idols, angels, celestial objects, atoms in nature, etc. If pantheism were true, it would not be wrong to worship such an object because that object would, in fact, be God. If pantheism were true, worshiping a rock or an animal would have just as much validity as worshiping God as an invisible and spiritual being. The Bible's clear and consistent denunciation of idolatry is a conclusive argument against pantheism. Now, the third worldview of the Godhead is monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in one only God. Now, notice how I said that in sort of a strange way. One only God. <laughs> Not just a belief in one God, but a belief in one only God. And that word only will become important to us later on. The word monotheism is from two Greek words. Monos, meaning single or alone, and theos, meaning God. One who believes in monotheism is called a monotheist. The world's three great monotheistic religions are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These faiths are known as the Abrahamic religions because each looks to Abraham as the father of the faithful. All three of these religions are also revealed religions. The adherents of a revealed religion believes that their God has directly communicated with mankind his existence and wishes, let me say that again because my cadence in reading was a little off. The adherents of a revealed religion believes that their God has directly communicated with mankind his existence and wishes through oracles, prophets, and our holy inspired, God-breathed scriptures. Revealed religion stands in opposition, therefore, to natural religion, which provides arguments for the existence of God based on reason and ordinary experiences of nature. The monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, each possess scripture, which is believed to be an authentic revelation of the character and expectations of their God, with detailed instructions in worship and lifestyle. For Judaism, those holy scriptures uh, is the Old Testament, the Torah in particular, the first five books. For Christianity, it is the complete Bible, consisting of both the Old and the New Testaments. For Islam, it is the Quran. While the Old and New Testaments are congruent concerning the deity of Jesus the Messiah, the Quran is incongruent in both to both the Old and New Testaments in this particular. The Quran denies any godhood to Christ at all. Our study of monotheism will mostly be confined to Christian monotheism as it is rooted in and a reflection of Hebraic monotheism. Now, we must introduce a caveat concerning the legitimacy of Islam as a true monotheistic religion. The monotheism of Islam is of a different genre from the monotheism of either the Hebrews or Christianity, in that Allah was not always the one God of the Arabs. Allah seems to be a reviving of the Hebrew moon god, Uba, as the first among equals. Huba was associated with the black stone that even to this day continues to be revered in the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Muslim's most holy place on the earth. And they see it as associated with Allah. By the way, 
Allah is not a proper name uh, for God like Yahweh is for uh, the God of the Old Testament. Allah is simply Arabic for God. That God that Allah is now called uh, was the former moon god Huba, but now the Arabs just say God or Allah. Through a series of military conquests and coercions carried out by his followers, Allah of Huba, having dropped the name of Huba, came to be, was well, not always, but came to be the one God of Islam. So in that sense, Allah, the God of Islam, is not, cannot lay claim to being, or let me say it this way, Muslims and Islam cannot lay claim to monotheism in the same sense that Jews and Christians may. Now, the terms, there are different terms for the different Godhead paradigms within Christian monotheism. The first one we want to look at is, and the oldest, is monarchianism, or to be more correctly, modalistic monarchianism. Now, this is the belief that God is one sentient being who has revealed himself in three different modes of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, without altering his substance of deity in any way. These three modes of Yahweh, God's existence, are different in manifestation and administration, but it is the same one Lord God in each mode. The one God who, with reference to the relation in which he stands and reacts to the world, is called Father, but in reference to his appearance in humanity, is called the Son. Further, in reference to his presence in the lives of believers, is called the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different designations of the same subject, albeit in different administrations. Now, this is monarchianism. Monarchianism is the most ancient paradigm for Christian monotheism. To be more particular and more exact, modalistic monarchianism was the doctrine and teaching of the apostles and the apostolic church fathers and the orthodoxy of the first 300 years of the church's existence. The administrations of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are referenced as the economy of God. The present economy is not an eternal configuration of God, but serves as Yahweh's economy to facilitate the redemption of a fallen creation. Modalism, or more correctly, modalistic monarchianism, is the original orthodoxy of the Christian faith and is the ancient term for what has been called in the 20th century oneness. So let's talk about that term just now, oneness. Oneness is another paradigm within Christian monotheism. Oneness, the belief that God is one sentient being, manifested in three offices of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that Jesus is that one God being in human form. There are no differences, really, between oneness and monarchianism. Thirdly is Benetarianism. Benetarianism is a belief in two sentient beings in one essence, a God family, who are in perfect harmony and agreement with each other, with one another, composed of the Father and the Son as two distinct God persons, and the Holy Spirit as not a God, but rather as the living power of God that flows or emanates between the Father and the Son. Trinitarianism is another paradigm within Christian monotheism. 
The belief that God eternally exists as three sentient or rational beings, individuals, persons, called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, each sharing one God essence or nature. Each individual is fully God, separate from the other two. In its modern form, Trinitarianism's claim to monotheism is that of one God nature. This one God nature is, however, shared by three God persons. Each one of these persons are rational with their own centers of consciousness. Trinitarianism, in this view, has one what but three who's. Now, having said that, it should be pointed out that to many who hold this worldview of the Godhead, the oneness is in the unity of the three persons. And to this class of Trinitarianism, God is one in a compound sense. It really, Trinitarianism is an evolved theology that did not reach any form of codification until the writing of the Athanasian Creed at some point in the 7th or 8th centuries. In some respects, its form is still in flux, as is seen in those who claim monotheism from the one nature shared by three rational persons. These confess one God in that God is one ontologically. And also then there's those other, that other set of Trinitarians whose claim to monotheism is in the total unity between the three rational God persons. Another worldview of the Godhead within Christian monotheism is Arianism, named for Arius, who lived between 250 and... Uh, uh, who wrote around the time of 250 to 256, uh, who was an ascetic North African Christian presbyter and priest in Alexandria, Egypt. He was of uh, Libyan origins. Arius, we have a physical definition of him given in history. He was tall, lean, learned, morally exemplar, a fine orator and inclined to be disputatious, was educated in a theological school of Antioch under the distinguished scholar Lucian. This school was noted for its emphasis on, one, the historical and inducive method of religious investigation, and two, the unity and transcendency of the Godhead. Combined with these was a tendency to regard Christ as a created being subordinate to the Father, a view that affected Arius in a great and serious way. His teaching on the Godhead was the belief that God is one sentient rational being and that Jesus is his first creation. As such, Jesus is his son and may be called God in the second sense and by association. Mostly, the Holy Spirit is viewed as the Spirit of God and not another person from him by Arius. However, some Arians, followers of Arius, see Jesus as the archangel Michael or even Gabriel. Many groups who are Arians call themselves Unitarians. Arianism claims... <clears throat> Uh, Arianism's claim to monotheism is that the Father is the only true God and therefore excludes Jesus of Nazareth from the Godhead in any real sense. In the Arian belief, Jesus is the first created being of God. Modern, institutionalized Arians are the Jehovah's Witnesses, followers of Herbert W. Armstrong, or Armstrongism, and the Way International. However, they differ in their understanding of Christ's relationship to the Father. The several distinct branches of Arianism, which sometimes conflict with each other, 
as well as with the pro nicene homoousian creed of the monarchians, can be roughly broken down into the following classifications. Now, as I go into these classifications, I'm going to beg a license, because I'm going to be making an attempt to pronounce words that we seldom ever, ever pronounce orally. So how they sounded in the Greek is up for debate. So I'm going to make my best to try, okay? So the first different branch within Arianism that I want to talk about is the Homoiousianism. This is from uh, Homois. Homois means similar, which maintains that the sun is like in substance, but not necessarily to be identified with the essence of the Father. The third one is the Homoinism, also from Homois, which declares that the Son is similar to God the Father without reference to substance or essence. Some supporters of Homoian formulae also support one of the other descriptions. Other Homoians declare that God the Father is so incomparable and ineffable transcendent that even the idea of likeness or similarity or identity in substance <coughs> excuse me or essence with the subordinate son and the Holy Spirit are heretical and not justified by the Gospels they hold that the Father is like the Son in some sense <coughs> but that even to speak of usia is impertinent speculation. Another group is the heterousianism, including a nomianism, which holds that God the Father and the Son were different in substance and are attributes. But further word must be said, a further word must be said concerning homoianism. In the fourth century Christianity, Homoians, also spelled uh, A N O M E A N S, uh, Homoians, and known as Heterousians, were a sect that upheld an extreme form of Arianism, which denied not only that Jesus Christ was the same nature, consubstantial, as God the Father, but also that he was a like nature, homoi, as maintained by the semi-Arians. The word honomoian comes from the Greek a, which means not, and uh, omois, homois, which means similar, which means different or dissimilar, or not similar. In the fourth century, during the reign of Constantius II, this was the name by which the followers of Atius and Eunomius were distinguished as a theological party. The semi-Arians condemned the Anamoians in the Council of Seleucia in September the 27th, 359. The Anamoians in turn condemned the semi-Arians in the councils of Antioch in 341 and Constantinople in 359 thereby erasing the words usia and homoiousias from the formula of Rimini and that of Constantinople. They were advocating that the Lagos had not only a different substance, but also a different will from that of the Father. From that, they were to be called anomoioi. <laughs> In the 5th century, the Anomoian presbyter Philostorgius wrote an Anomoian church history. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for your license. The fourth century produced Arian creeds that attempted to replace the Orthodox formula of Nicaea. The Arian creed produced at the Council of Constantinople in 359 
is given in both Greek and English in addendum to page 573 of the work Godhead Theology. Notable opponents of the Honomoyanism were Basil of Caesarea, Bishop of Caesarea, and author of Against Eunomius, and Gregory of Nazianzian, Archbishop of Constantinople, prolific writer and orator. Now, we must talk also about the semi-Arians, or semi-Arianism. Semi-Arianism was a middle road position between the radical monotheism of modalistic monarchianism and the subordinationism of the Arian party. Many at the first ecumenical council held in Nicaea in 8325 denied being Arians, but were sympathetic to Arius and his theology. It is acknowledged by historians that most at the council were unhappy with the monarchian watchword homoousius and would have much preferred homoousius. The only difference is the iota. That's where we get, that's where we get uh, the statement. It doesn't make an iota of difference, but here the iota makes a lot of difference. Homoousius means same substance, essence, while homoi, with the I, means like or similar substance or essence. Now, the larger group, the semi-Arians, later rebelled against the, uh, against the Nicene formula and caused much trouble in the church. Even the great champion of the faith, Athanasius himself, was driven from his church on more than one occasion and replaced by Arian or semi-Arian prelates. Eusebius of Caesarea was one of the leaders of the anti-homoousius group. Human nature being what it is, the middle road eventually won out in the end, and the semi-Arians seeking to walk a middle road between the monotheism of the monarchians and the monotheism of the Arians in time produced a compromise position that we now, sadly, call Trinitarianism. The subordinationism of Arius can still be seen in Western Orthodoxy descendant from Rome in the fact that they allow suffering in the person of God the Son, but cannot countenance suffering in the person of God the Father. Their charge of patripassianism, the Father suffered, leveled at modalism, is proof that they do not quite see the Son as being as much God as they hold the Father to be. If this were not true, why would it make any difference whether it was the Father who suffered or whether it was the Son? They call their doctrine Trinitarianism. Likewise, subordinate, the subordinationism of Arius continues to be seen and believed in Eastern Orthodox churches in the fact that Eastern Orthodoxy views the Father as the proper and only fountainhead of deity. All deity flows from Father God. This is seen in their firm insistence that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father. Now, that would not be a problem if they did not hold that the Son and the Holy Spirit were separate individuals from the Father with their own centers of consciousness, intellect, volition, and emotion. In this view, neither the Son nor the Holy Spirit is quite God the same way the Father is God. They also call their doctrine Trinitarianism. Let's talk a moment about Unitarianism as we round this up. Before we move from this chapter, a word must be said about Unitarianism. The label Unitarian K 
can be confusing because it's used to reference the adherence of modalism, also called oneness, and also Arianism. That's the two extreme poles of Godhead theology, but yet Unitarianism is used for both of them at times. This is true because Unitarianism affirms the total unity of God as one sentient being, one sentient rational being. Both modalism and Arianism do that. Unitarianism is in direct contrast to Trinitarianism that has redefined the word being to mean nature and affirms three rational persons, entities, individuals within their one being or within their one nature. So when reading material that is labored Unitarian or listening to a speaker who is speaking about Unitarianism, the reader or the listener should watch for qualifying statements to announce which type of Unitarianism the writer or the speaker is referencing. The Unitarian modalist will always affirm the full deity of Jesus Christ as being but another mode of the Father's existence, the Father in another way of being. The Unitarian Arian will always deny the full deity of Jesus Christ altogether and make him a creature. In the end, beloved, theology is just the humble pursuit of the knowledge of God. Amen. Thank you for listening to our reading today of the introduction to the book entitled Godhead Theology. Until next time, I am Bishop Jerry Hayes, and I am praying, my friend, that you go with God, for he goes with you. And it is my prayer that God sanctify you wholly in mind, body, spirit, and soul. The Lord bless and keep you is my prayer.